Welcome to another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading the 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 second Eddard chapter. In the previous episodes we've sort of introduced most of the main point of view characters, most of the key players who we will learn to learn to love over the following chapters, the following books, but once we've int- now that we've introduced them, we're starting to delve a bit deeper into who these characters are, what their conflicts are, what their pasts are, and what their futures are, as we are to discover. So in this second Eddard chapter, Ned's at Winterfell. He's decided to go south to King's Landing with his king and his friend and his war buddy, Robert Baratheon. And the chapter says that in the morning, the king summons Ned to have a chat. Um, which sort of right away, like, it, the one, one of the things that this chapter int- explores is the relationship between Ned, uh, Ned Stark and Robert, because they do have many, many different sort of concurrent relationships going on at once, like, they are, they are friend and friend, and, 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 and they are in a way sort of brothers in the sense that they kind of grew up together, uh, in the Eyrie under John Aaron, uh, and they also have a relationship as, as, as a political, a, a lord to a king, a subservient political relationship, um, and, and they've also got a changed relationship in between the events of Robert's Rebellion until now, when they spent a lot of time apart. So Ned and Robert in this chapter are still sort of negotiating what, who they are, in relation to each other, after uh, in between all these different formal relationships and all the change that they've gone through. That's sort of uh, some of what's explored here. Anyway, so Ned's gone out to go have a chat with Robert. Um, we have a mention of, of, of Alan, who's just this bloke, just this guardsman who serves with the Starks. And that's... Th- there are lots of these guys who are mentioned throughout the books who, uh, who don't get a lot of press, who certainly don't really properly appear in the show. But but in the books we often do hear uh, the fates of some of these guys, some of these some of these blokes who uh, are just sort of tertiary, quaternary characters, but who often have little snippets of personality and history. And when you start to notice their paths through the series, it can often be fascinating and sad to, to see the eventual and usually grisly fates uh, anyway so rob go, ned goes out to see robert uh and so and so ned's like all right come in and we'll we'll have a chat we'll have a meeting and, and ned's like sitting i can't i can't talk sitting down i've got to go fucking let's let's go out into the wilder wildernessness man let's let's fucking tear up some shit let's let's come on let's have a power meeting a power lunch <laughs> that's what they call it don't they when like the corporates in the suits go and have a power a power yoga or a power power brunch while they're talking about their stock prices that's uh, isn't that what they do so so robert's like oh, i'm i want to ride while we talk fuck sitting around in tents i want to ride like a man was meant to do uh he says uh like a like a man was meant to ride let's fucking uh, that's what i want to do um and so they sort of race off the king and and lord eddard race off on their horses into the into the north uh, and Robert's having a great time, Ned's a bit sort of fucking whatever, um, oh yeah, well yeah, they're not actually, at, yeah, they're not at Winterfell, they're, they're travelling the King's Road south, they've left Winterfell, they're heading towards King's Landing, and, and Robert's loving just getting fucking riding out there, uh, he's frustrated by the slow pace of the wheelhouse, the, all, the, all the ladies and the nobility and all the soft people are sitting in the wheelhouse, which is slowly being carted south, and Robert is frustrated by that. Robert is not a patient man. He's he's a fa- he's a fan of the instant gratification, whether that comes in the form of of a broken skull of an enemy, or or a tit of a woman, or a horn of ale, whatever he is, he wants to reach out and grab it immediately. He's not so into the long game in the way that some people like Varus are, or Illyrio Mepatis are. 
those guys' games are so long that we still haven't fucking seen what they are in five long, <laughs> long ass books. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that, so uh, yeah, they're sort of bantering. They're just sort of chatting, and Rob and Robert's like, let's just keep writing. Like, let's leave all these these fuckos behind, and let's just go on an adventure together, you and me, vagabonds, like the Wolf Mother song. Let's just go. Let's just do it, man. Let's just hang out. Uh, and Ned sort of is is the wet blanket on Robert's parade, just to m- mix metaphors. Uh, and and Daddy's like, but you got duties, you got you got you got responsibilities, man. You got responsi- responsibilities. Uh, and and Robert's like, fuck, yeah, man. You don't know what fun is, Ned. Um, and um. And Robert's like, oh, but you used to know what fun was. Who was that woman who you who you fucked once? Who what was uh, uh, Alina, uh, M- M- Meryl, Fatima, Lorenza, Willa, says Ned. He replies with cool courtesy, Willa, and I would sooner not speak of her. And so what they're discussing here is the identity of the woman who who is the mother of Jon Snow. So Robert sort of fucking ribs him and is sort of going, Oh, mm, must have been a hell of a woman to make Lord Eddard Stark forget his honour. Must have been, ooh. And Ned's like, I don't want to fucking, don't make me, I, n- n- no, we are not, I do not want to talk about this. It was dishonourable, it was dishonourable. I dishonoured myself. Oh, do, 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 do. So supposedly what we're talking about here is Ned during Robert's Rebellion, sleeping with some random woman and, and fathering the bastard Jon Snow. Um, uh, but there's very good reason to suggest at the Tower of Joy with Lyanna Stark that, in fact, what Ned's really trying to hide here is not a moment of weakness giving in and slighting his honour by having sex uh, while uh, cheating on his wife, Catelyn. Uh, in reality, he's actually hiding a more serious secret. Uh, but 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 Robert doesn't know that, so he's sort of fucking given the old eh, 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 to Ned, and um, and he's having none of it. Uh, and so Rob is frustrated by Ned being so fucking Ned and not wanting to get into this shit. Um, um, and yeah, Robert says that Ned is so prickly that he ought to take the hedgehog for his sigil, which is, which is kind of nice. I think someone does have a hedgehog for their sigil. I'm not sure who. But I think someone does. Uh, anyway, uh, so they sort of they notice. So they've been riding, and they come across some like big, big, big rocks, some sort of stonehengey, big ass rocks, ancient shit. And Rob's like, "What the fuck is this? Is this a graveyard?" And Ned's like, "Oh, you know, there's there's barrows. This is a barrow. There are barrows everywhere in the north, Your Grace. This land is old." Which again contributes to this sort of feel uh, of of the North as like a sort of unique and 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 historied and mis- and mystical place. We get we get little tidbits like that sort of add to, um, and uh, oh, and so Robert reveals a, a piece of information that presumably was the point of this whole meeting. Uh, ne- Robert says that he got some information from Varus the eunuch. Um, this is the first mention of Varus the eunuch, the spy master in King's Landing, and the letter from Varus is relaying information from Jorah Mormont. So Jorah Mormont is now, uh, who was from the north and is now serving with Daenerys Targaryen. But the thing is, at this point, Jorah is actually is actually an inside man. He's a mole, a mole man, mole bear, mole bear Jorah, uh, and and he's actually feeding information about Daenerys's activities to uh, Varus. And and King Robert in the hopes of getting a pardon and being being able to come back from the north uh, to the north because of course he left he he ran away he was exiled uh, because he sold slaves uh, in order to buy the luxuries that his wife of the time demanded it's a sad sad story but the point is that 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 through Jorah King Robert and Varys have gotten some information about Daenerys that she's marrying this Dothraki horse lord. So we get this information from far, far, along, far away. Um, uh, and Robert's like, well, we should have to fucking kill her. And then we get some sort of history exposition about uh, Robert's relationship with the Targaryens and how he hates them so fucking much. Um, and, 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 and Ned reflects on sort of his 
experience of the consequences of Robert's hatred. So they talk about the bloodied corpses of, of Rhaegar's children who were killed during the sack of King's Landing, and, and Ned saw that as a despicable act, the murder of these kids, whereas Robert was like their dragon spawn. I see no babes, only dragon spawn. So he's not only hateful, but, but dehumanizing to the Targaryens. Um, he, re- he really fucking demonizes the Targaryens, all of them, far beyond what is really reasonable. R- Robert Baratheon is sort of like this guy who, who n- he, needs, he needs a simple, clear goal, and he needs a simple, clear enemy. You know, he, he he needs a woman he can quest for with all his might, and he needs an, an opponent who he can smack on the head as hard as he can, and that's how complex he wants life to be. That's what Robert Baratheon's like. He, he wants life to be a video game, where you can just kill the baddies and you'll get the points and win the day. That's, that's how Robert Baratheon wants to live, and that's how he sees things. It's very black and white. And of course, one of the themes of this whole book is about how things aren't black and white. The bad guys aren't just simple bad guys, and the goals aren't simple ultimate goods. It's Things are more complex than that, and that's part of why Robert Baratheon fails so miserably as a king and why he dies, spoiler, so soon into the book. Uh, uh, we also have mention of Tywin Lannister and how he's renowned for, for the, the slaughter of innocents. He's cruel, he's cruel and harsh, uh, is how we get word of Tywin Lannister. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they talk about the history with Targaryens, uh, and Robert's like, look, man, I, I want Daenerys Targaryen dead. She's, she's a Targaryen, she could create problems for my reign, I want her assassinated. Um... And, and Ned is like, you can't just go fucking murdering children all the time, dude. It's it's wrong. It's unspeakable. Uh, and, and Ned, yeah, and Robert, Robert rants about all the horrible things that the Targaryens did to him, did to Lyanna. So we get this story about how Rhaegar abducted and raped Lyanna Stark, Ned's sister, um, which, you know, may in fact have been more of a more of a, more of a consensual, uh, what's the term when you run away to, to Switzerland, uh, when you abscond, when you, when you run away to get married, there's a word for that, for when you leave specifically, anyway, so, 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 fucking R- R- Robert's mad, and he says he will kill every Targaryen he can get his hands on, um, and, and Ned says, well, you can't get your hands on this one, though, can you? And so what that... So that's interesting, because because on the surface, that's Ned referring to Daenerys Targaryen. Ned saying, oh, you want to kill Daenerys Targaryen because she can't, because she's a continent away. But, R plus L equals J being true, you can actually connect that to Jon Snow. So, like, the whole reason why Ned is is believed to hide Jon Snow, claim that he's his bastard when it's actually Lyanna Stark and Rhaegar Targaryen's kid, is because Robert would want to kill Jon as the son of Rhaegar Targaryen. Uh, and so when he says, but you can't get your hands on this one, he could subtly, in in one sense, be referring to Jon Snow, because Robert can't get his hands on Jon Snow, because Jon Snow's just been sent to the north to join the, the Night's Watch on the wall. There, there are lots of these little double meanings that you can find throughout the text. So, you know, some of them, some of these double meanings uh, were put there by the author, some of them may not have been. But in any case, there's cool shit here to point out. Anyway, uh, so so Robert's like, yeah, fuck, it is kind of a hassle to assassinate Daenerys. Uh, they talk a bit about John Aaron, who recently died, who they both loved, and how he was a great bloke. Um... Uh, but they talk some more about how serious the threat of Daenerys Targaryen is. Because Ned's like, oh, well, she's not going to... I mean, even if she gets all these Dothraki behind her and they want to invade, or Viserys Targaryen wants to invade, this, that's not really going to be a problem, is what Ned argues. But Robert's like, eh, it fucking could, because there are still people out there who support the Targaryen regime. There are still people out there who feel loyalty to, to the Mad King, the dead Mad King Ares and stuff. Um, so, so some of that stuff does mirror what Illyrio Mepatis told, tells Viserys about, like, like a certain uh, thread of rebellious uh, lords and, and people who would side with the Targaryens. Although that is emphasised less in later chapters. Perhaps that's something that George R. R. Martin kind of changed his mind on. Because in, la- in the later stuff, it do- we don't get as much indication of this idea of lords and people in Westeros who really want the Targaryens to come back. There are, like, some common folk, but there's there's little mention of that later. Um, uh, they also talk about what's going to happen to the Vale. 
uh, after the death of John Arryn, because John Arryn was, of course, Lord of the Vale, um, and John Arryn's son, Sweet Robin, little little Robin Arryn, Robert Arryn, um, he's sick and weak and a bit shit. Uh, so so Robert's like, I don't, he he can't he can't rule the Vale, and there's this title of Warden of the East, which gives you like command over the of the armies of the East or some shit, and and Robert's like, well, I'll give that to Jamie Lannister, and um. And Ned's like giving it to Jamie Lannister, like, but 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 Tywin Lannister is Warden of the West, so if you make Jamie Lannister the Warden of the East and Tywin the West, the Lannisters get a huge amount of political power here. That that's too much. That's uh, that's an that's an imbalance of power. Um, and Robert's like, well, yeah, I know, but like, fuck. I mean, my wife Cersei's always fucking bugging me about it, so I'll just fucking do it, whatever. <laughs> um, and Ned's like, fuck. Well, all right, I can't, I can't really argue with that, can I? Um, and yeah, but they also talk about the honor of Jamie Lannister, and Ned thinks uh, Jamie's uh, honor is slighted by having killed the the king Aerys, who he swore to protect. So Ned Ned is quite judgy in these chapters. He's got very strong moral opinions on what what the king should and should not do, and and you know. To be fair, I mean, there's, there's, there's. You can argue that he's pretty true about a lot of what he says, but you can also argue to the contrary. I mean, he might be wrong about his assessment of the danger posed by the Targaryens and stuff like that. Um, but on the other hand, you, you you can see how Ned and Robert's relationship they sort of balance off each other nicely. So Robert has all this energy to fucking do stuff and hit stuff and make stuff happen. He's got the fury and the passion. He's got the fucking chutzpah. Whereas Ned has that sort of cold calm, cautious demeanor, and he has the, the more, it's like the, it's like Ned is the super ego, and Robert is the id, kind of, I'd let, to use the super overused Freudian, that, that, yeah, anyway, um, so, they're like, fucking, let's, let's go for it, um, and, yeah, they're just talking more about the backstory with Robert's Rebellion and stuff, and the sack of King's Landing. And so, another thing that they're emphasizing repeatedly here is the Lannisters not being trustworthy. In these in these early parts of Book 1, where it's all about the fucking, oh, the Lannisters, they're fucking up to do no good. Um, uh, which, of course, we learn much more about in a more, in a more subtle way later, a uh, nuanced way later. Um, and, and we have this line... About about how troubled sleep is no stranger to to Eddard. He's he has lived his lies for fourteen years, yet they still haunt him at night. And that's one of those sort of biggest pieces of evidence for R plus L equals J. Because um, if it's true that John is just a bastard son of Ned, what what are these lies? that Ned's been telling for 14 years, the age of Jon Snow. What are these lies? Um, I mean, you know, there are conspiracy theorists who say that, oh, it's actually a Shara Dane or some shit. Um, so, maybe. Um, but in any case, it, you can argue either way, but, but, the, but the, the lies clearly indicate that some kind of shenanigans, at least, uh, surrounds the birth of Jon Snow, or at least the events 14 years ago. Um... Something's up, is, is the point of that. That's uh, At this point in the story, it's meant to plant the seeds for you to wonder about the mystery of what happened in those times. Because uh, we also get those words, Promise me, Ned. Lyanna had whispered. So what are the lies? What is the promise? Those are those first seeds about R plus L equals J. Uh, and, and then we get a bit of pathos from Robert. Robert talks about how, like, because, you know, again, like, he sees life as this video game, you know? He wants things to be simple. He wants to kill the bad guys and get the girl and, ha- and live happily ever after, but things didn't work out that way. Uh, he, he won the war, but, you know, he didn't, he didn't get the girl. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, it's a hollow victory, he says. Uh, Robert's Rebellion was a hollow victory. Uh, and they talk about, yeah, so Ned is harping on about how the Lannisters are all shits and how Jaime Lannister sat the Iron Throne, um, uh, after the sack of King's Landing. Um, and, and yeah, so Ned recounts Jamie's words, uh, when they found him sitting on the throne and everyone's like, shit, is Jamie going to fucking try and claim the throne of Westeros? Uh, but, but Jamie says, have no fear, Ned. I was only keeping the throne warm. For your friend Robert, it's not a very comfortable seat, I'm afraid. Which is, uh, on on the one hand, you know, just sort of establishing, emphasising Jamie being, you know, a bit of a rude twat, but also it's emphasising 
the idea of the Iron Throne as a not very comfortable seat, which is so very true for Robert. He doesn't enjoy being a king, he doesn't enjoy the responsibility, and further, people tend not to last on the Iron Throne very long, as we are, as we are soon to learn with Joffrey and Tommen and Co. Um, so, yeah, they're sort of talking a bit about Jamie and whatever. Um, and in the end, Robert's like, all right, well, fuck, we've been talking about all this shit about this politics, this history of betrayal. Fuck it, look, I'm I'm sick of this. Let's just fucking I, t- I tell you, let's just ride, let's just go, let's just fuck. Uh, so his his words are that he is heartily sick of squabbles and secrets and matters of state. Uh, and sadly for Robert, that's that's a large amount of what the rest of this book consists of is is squabbles and secrets and matters of state. It sounds reductive when he says it that way, uh, but some of the intrigue and politics that we're about to get to in the rest of this series uh, is truly some of what makes Game of Thrones back, uh, the series great, uh, and we're about to see a lot of it in the future of this series. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, Robert rides the fuck off, um, and... Ned has this deep sense of helplessness and resignation, because uh, he's sort of realizing that that Robert may be a great guy, but he's not really equipped to deal with these squabbles and secrets and matters of estate. Uh, and Ned suspects that he himself too is perhaps not so well equipped for these secrets and squabbles and matters of estate. So it's almost with a sense of impending doom that Ned puts his boots into his horse and sets off after the king. So it's almost as though there's like a there's like a semi self aware changing of the guard happening here. Like what we just got there was a lot of history and backstory, largely. It's like the old boys the boys are back in town. It's fucking Robert and and Robert King Robert and 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 Neddy Neddy Stark Wolfman and and they're both sort of talking about their pasts and their accomplishments and there is sort of this creeping recognition that there are new problems on the horizon with the Lannisters and Danny Targaryen, which neither of them are really all that well placed to deal with. There's a definite sense that the old guard uh, are, are sort of dropping the baton on this one, so someone else is going to have to pick it up. Uh, so, helpfully, uh, at around the same time, we have this new generation of younger characters also being introduced as POV characters, like Tyrion, like Daenerys, like Jon Snow, like Bran, like Arya, like Sansa, people who uh, who have no history at this point, who don't, who who are naive, and who, who have... Who, who are also not shaped into the people who are going who they're going to be. Like Ned has lines in this chapter where he talks about how like oh Robert Robert will do what he always did. This is the nature of Robert and he won't he won't change. He'll just keep on doing what he's always done. Uh, and Ned also has this sort of sense of resignation that he is sort of so bound up in his secrets and his honor and his responsibilities and his titles that he can't really change either. Whereas all these younger kids who have been introduced to jo- John and Arya and Sansa, they're also changeable. You know, they're those fucking stem cells. You know, they can they can they can adapt to whatever fucking circumstance that they'll be put in for better or for worse. Um, so, so, so Ned and Robert are on the down. These other POV characters are on the up. There's there's change in, on the cosmic level, on the personal level, on the political level. These are the these are the big major themes and threads that are being established and and put into place at the beginning of this story, ready for more conflict and change and crazy shit on the way. When this story continues. So thank you for watching. This is Alt Swift X. We're going to have a new upload schedule, release schedule uh, now, I think. We're not going to do daily releases because that is frankly insane. Uh, but we will do, I think, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. You can tune in those days and there'll be a new episode for you and I think that way we can get a good good steady pace of Alt Swift X but at the same time without without being too demanding we don't want to burn out so I think that's how we'll proceed from now on uh, in any case thank you for watching listening slash whatever however you're doing this uh, and I will see you next time <laughs>